Welcome to the third and final module of our corn breeding lesson. Now on to modern times. Plant breeding is still based on the same general principles as in the last century, but technology has drastically changed and major improvements have occurred. When it comes to corn breeding in modern times, the objectives are often much more specific than they were in the past. It's not enough to have a goal to make corn better. Breeders improve corn by selecting for very specific traits. The main goals in general for modern corn breeding include increasing yield, increasing pest resistance, whether insect or disease, increasing tolerance to stresses such as drought, and sometimes other traits come into play. Yield is almost always at the top of the list when it comes to breeding corn. Yield is a complex trait and there are many factors that come into play such as yield stability, which refers to yielding well across different years and locations. Standability is the ability of a corn plant to remain standing upright even under adverse conditions. Standability affects yield because corn stalks that have fallen over are not able to be harvested, and that affects yield negatively, no matter how much corn grain yield that plant may have. Corn is susceptible to many different insect pests and diseases, Breeding can make plants less vulnerable to pests. Pictured are corn rootworm larvae, which feed on the roots of corn and cause great damage to the plants. Corn uses a lot of water and fertilizer as it grows. Some breeding efforts are devoted to increasing corn's tolerance to drought and to soils that are less fertile. There are other traits that breeders look for, such as timing of maturity, early seedling and plant vigor, and controlling moisture content at harvest. They even target genetics that make a corn plant better for certain climates and geographical areas. Now that we know what some of the goals of modern breeding are, we can examine the techniques. We will first discuss what is called traditional or conventional breeding. You will see that even with new advances in technology, traditional techniques are still an important part of the breeding process. Here is an overview of modern corn breeding. You can see from this graphic that there are many steps in the corn breeding process before the farmer even gets to buy the new hybrid. Breeders select suitable starting materials, and then the process begins. The development of inbreds today is very similar to how it was done in the past. Breeders self-pollinate successive generations until offspring are genetically identical. There are many steps of selfing plants and growing them for seed to develop inbreds. The first generation is self-pollinated. Offspring are selected and that generation is also selfed. Normally it takes five to eight generations of repeating this process to get inbreds to be genetically pure. Modern inbreds are more productive and vigorous than those used in the past. Remember that corn is a primarily cross-pollinating species where wind disperses pollen from the tassel of one plant to the silk of a different plant. Plant breeders must control the natural tendencies of corn during the pollination process to ensure that only self-pollination occurs to get an inbred line. Let's take a look at how plant breeders control pollination in the field. Managing pollination is done by hand in the field. Before the tassel sheds pollen, breeders will securely cover the tassel with a bag. This will capture the pollen that is released. Just like the male tassels, the female flowers in the ear have to be covered with bags prior to silk emergence to protect them from capturing the wrong pollen. Again, this step is done by hand. When the silks of the ear are at the correct stage, the bag protecting the ear is removed and replaced with a bag containing pollen from the tassel of the same plant. The pollen that is in the bags comes into contact with the silks. Pollination and fertilization can then occur with the assurance that no unwanted pollen has entered the process. The plant will then produce seed that will be harvested, and that seed will be planted. 
to continue the process of selfing for several generations until the inbred is produced. As you may have noticed, it takes a long time just to produce the inbreds. In the next step, the inbreds are evaluated. Most of the corn breeding process is devoted to inbred development and evaluation. Some traits can be predicted at the inbred stage, but there are still many unknowns, especially with yield traits. New inbreds are tested for performance by crossing them with a known inbred and their performance is assessed. Inbreds that perform well move on to the next step based on breeding goals. Good inbreds, also called elite inbreds, have the best potential to make good hybrids. Hundreds of thousands of inbred lines have been developed since the beginning of hybrid production, but very few of these ultimately have been used to develop hybrids. You may recall that inbreds perform weakly, but there are still qualities that breeders need them to have to continue the breeding process. As a corn plant has both male and female flowers, the tassel and the ear, an individual can serve as either the male or female parent. Corn breeders want inbred serving as the female line to have good silk emergence and flowering uniformity, high seed yield, and resistance to lodging, while male inbred corn lines need to have good pollen production from the tassel, have adequate height, and have resistance to lodging. The next step is taking promising inbreds and crossing them with other good inbreds to form new hybrids. Most hybrids today are the result of single crosses. Seeds of the inbreds are planted so that the male and female plants have synchronized flowering of the tassel in the ear. The ear of the plant to be used as the female line is bagged. In fact, the plant that is used as the female also has its tassel removed since its pollen will not come into play in this process. The tassel of the plant to be used as the male line is also bagged at pollen shed, usually the day before pollination. Finally, when both plants are at the correct stage, a cross between two inbreds can be made. The bag from the female ear is removed and replaced with the pollen bag from the male plant, and pollination and fertilization can occur. Seed will be collected from the subsequent hybrid and will be evaluated in the next step. Now the hybrids have to be evaluated. It is important that hybrids' performance be tested over multiple years in multiple environments. This demonstrates whether a hybrid has stability and adaptability, or in other words, a more predictable outcome when the farmer grows the hybrid. Environments where the hybrids will be tested are similar to the target market. Upper Midwest hybrids will be tested under different conditions than hybrids that will be marketed for the South. Plants are grown under competitive conditions, such as a higher than normal plant intensity, in order to weed out poor performers. At advanced stages, hybrids are grown in farmers' fields and evaluated compared to other hybrids. Here is an example of the process that a hybrid might have gone through. 
At each successive stage, more hybrids are eliminated based on performance. In stage 1, several hundred newly created hybrids are grown at about five locations. In stage 2, hybrids from stage 1 are pared down to 100 and grown at 20 locations. In stage 3, hybrids from stage 2 are pared down to 20 and grown at 50 locations. In stage 4, the top 10 hybrids are grown at about 75 research plot locations and 300 farms. At stage 5, maybe as few as 5 hybrids remain to be grown at 75 research plot locations and 1,000 farms. At this point, a commercial number is assigned to the hybrids. As you can see, out of the hundreds of hybrids that are created, very few make it to the final stage. Hybrids throughout the process are evaluated based on the goals of the corn breeder for traits such as yield, pest resistance, and the other factors we mentioned earlier in this module. This usually takes about three to five years. The best of the best hybrids will be put on the commercial market to be sold to farmers, but first they must go into seed production. When breeders have enough seed of the parent inbreds, they start the process of producing hybrid seed on a large scale to sell to farmers. Fields being used to produce the commercial hybrid seed are physically isolated from other corn plants to prevent cross-pollination from neighboring fields. Both inbred parent lines are planted in the hybrid seed corn field at the proper time in order to synchronize pollen shed and ear silking of the two different inbred lines. The male and female rows alternate in the field, usually with three to six rows of female for every one to two rows of male. In this example plot, two rows of male plants alternate with four rows of female plants. The next step is to control the pollination process. This is done by detasseling the female inbred plants so that only the male inbred plants produce pollen. A specific machine is used for detasseling, and workers walk through the rows to get tassels that the machine has missed. Here is what a field looks like after detasseling. The male rows still have tassels, while the female rows don't. Seed is only harvested from the female plants. Seed companies must demonstrate to farmers that new hybrids are better than currently available ones by marketing them. Farmers look at many factors when choosing hybrids, such as yield trials or their need for specific traits such as disease or insect resistance. Each year, farmers must purchase new seed. Hybrid selection is one of the most important decisions a farmer makes because it can make a big difference in yields and profits. So far, we have discussed traditional plant breeding approaches used for corn improvement. Today, advances in corn genetics knowledge have changed the way breeding is done. There are other techniques of breeding corn that we haven't yet discussed, ones that are based on biotechnology. Breeding is even more sophisticated when we begin to include the molecular aspects. Biotechnology covers the many techniques that are molecular based. However, many of the field techniques of conventional breeding still are part of this process, as you will see. There are many molecular techniques that come into play in corn breeding. The ones we will talk about here are gene sequencing, marker-assisted selection, and genetic engineering. Let's define two terms that will help us understand gene sequencing. The genome is an organism's entire genetic material, or in other words, all the genes present in that organism. Genes are segments of DNA that provide the genetic templates for synthesis of proteins 
that lead to the expression of particular traits. In 2009, the genome of corn was sequenced, meaning that the order of the subunits of its DNA has been determined. Corn contains about 32,000 genes, which is an amazing amount when you consider that humans have around 20,000. Scientists are working on identifying the sequences and functions of the corn genes which are associated with specific characteristics. This important information can be used in corn breeding programs. Another biotechnology approach is to use marker-assisted selection, which determines if desired traits are present at the molecular level. Marker-assisted selection helps corn breeders by quickly and efficiently determining if genes or traits are present in newly created inbreds and hybrids. In this technique, segments of DNA called molecular markers are used. Molecular markers are pieces of DNA that are located near genes or traits of interest. Molecular methods are used to detect these markers within a plant's genome. If they're present, then the genes or traits are also present. We will discuss the last molecular technique, genetic engineering, in greater detail. This process has been used to add some unique traits to corn. Genetic engineering is important to understand as this topic often comes up in the popular media. In traditional breeding, Breeders are transferring many genes by combining different parent inbreds to get the desired result in a hybrid. In genetic engineering, breeders can transfer individual genes directly into the genome of a corn plant, and they're not limited to just genes that are present in corn. They can take foreign genes from bacteria, other plants, or even animals. When genes are transferred via genetic engineering, they are called transgenes. In corn, most transgenes have come from bacteria. Pictured here is a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis under 1,000 time magnification. This bacteria has been a source of genes for genetically engineered corn. The two main types of corn transgenes are for herbicide tolerance and insect resistance, which as you will see later can offer many benefits to farmers. Let's discuss how scientists get transgenes into a plant. In order to perform genetic engineering, first a useful gene must be found, often from bacteria. Then that gene is isolated from the genome of the first species and copied. Genes then must be inserted into the plant cells of the target species. This process is called either gene transfer or transformation. So how do genetic engineers transfer genes from another organism into a cell of a corn plant? There are actually a few different ways. In corn the most commonly used technique is the use of a bacterium. It is called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. The bacterium transfers genes by infecting a corn plant cell and integrating the gene of interest into the DNA of that plant cell. Plant species have the ability to grow an entire plant from a single cell. Once a plant cell has the transgene, tissue culture techniques using artificial media that has nutrients can be used to grow the cells into plants. The goal is to create a functional plant that can pass the transgene and the desired trait to its offspring. Corn plants that have been genetically engineered can be described as transgenic, GE, which stands for genetically engineered, GMO, which stands for genetically modified organism, or as a biotech crop. 
The transgenic plant generated in the lab is used to develop a new inbred. Now that the trans gene is within an inbred, the subsequent steps of corn breeding will still occur and the inbred is used just like any other inbred. It is crossed with other inbreds that may or may not have trans genes in them. Hybrids are developed and evaluated until a few of them are good enough to be sold to farmers. Plant breeders go through a lot of effort to get one trans gene into the hybrids they develop, so these trans genes have very important functions. As we mentioned, the two main types of trans genes that corn has are for herbicide tolerance and insect resistance. Weeds and insect pests can cause much economic damage. Transgenic hybrids are one of the options that farmers can use to reduce this damage. Let's discuss the transgenic traits in corn in further detail. The first category of trans genes is herbicide tolerance. Weeds compete with corn and yield can be reduced because of them. Shown in this picture are corn plants being overgrown with weeds. This is not what farmers want. Herbicides are chemicals used to kill weeds, but they can also hurt the crop. Crops that have an herbicide tolerance trait are resistant to herbicides. This allows farmers to apply herbicides to kill weeds while not harming the crop. There are two types of herbicide tolerant transgenes, one for glyphosate herbicide and the other for glufosinate herbicide. The sources for both of these genes come from bacteria. Both herbicides are non-selective, which means they will kill most plants unless they have the transgene. Glyphosate resistance is known under the brand name Roundup Ready, and glufosinate resistance is known under the brand name Liberty Link. The second primary type of transgenes relates to insect resistance. Insects such as rootworm, cutworm, European corn borer, and earworm can cause considerable damage to corn. They reduce yields and can even cause plants to die. When hybrids have the transgenes for insect resistance, it reduces the need to apply insecticides for those pests. These transgenes are derived from a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, and corn with this trait is called Bt corn for short. There are two Bt traits. One Bt trait controls cutworm, corn borer, and earworm, and the second type controls rootworm. We've discussed several different transgenes, and actually hybrids can have more than one transgene. Hybrids with two or more transgenic traits are called stacked trait hybrids. For example, when two traits such as glyphosate resistance and corn borer resistance are in one hybrid, it is a double stacked hybrid. Some companies have created corn with up to eight stacked traits. In 2012, 21% of the corn acres planted in the United States had a single trans gene that made them tolerant of herbicide, and 15% had a single trans gene that made them resistant to insects. 52% of the corn acres planted in 2012 had stacked traits. All told, 88% of the corn acres planted in the U.S. in 2012 were planted to transgenic corn hybrids. There are advantages of biotechnology over conventional breeding techniques. It can be a faster, more efficient process. The results can be more predictable because only genes of interest are transferred. And it is useful for transferring specific and economically important traits like resistance to insects and herbicides. However, like any technology, there can be disadvantages in comparison to traditional methods. 
So far, biotechnology is less useful for complex traits such as yield. Transgenic hybrids can be more expensive to farmers, and pests can develop resistance so extra precautions need to be taken. Additionally, transgenic crops are prohibited in organic farming, and many European markets will not buy them. We now know more about modern corn breeding. Thank you for completing part 3. You have now finished the corn breeding lesson.